I am, I am truly blessed to be with you again. I am blessed. I am uberly blessed. Um, yeah. And today, in the audience, and I am with two of my heroes, actually. And there's a lot more, but there are two individuals here who have influenced me, who I have followed. Actually, right here, if I'm not mistaken, on this stage, I forget when it was, a couple years back, uh, one of my spiritual fathers, James Robinson. Help me recognize Daddy James, please. <laughs> right here on this stage, there was a moment, an encounter. Of, I can't even explain what took place, but the outcomes have, have had some serious ramifications in the body here and around the world. So, James, I love you. I am grateful to God for you believing that the best is yet to come. I am your spiritual Hispanic adopted son, <laughs> and you cannot deny me, my amigo. <laughs> and of course, I am in the presence of el pastor numero uno que existe, el mejor pastor, the best pastor on the planet. I want to be like him when I grow up, Pastor Robert Morris. His lovely wife, to all the leaders, I just want to just share a word now. This is, I was with you in the Blessed Weekend Conference, but there's a, there's a word that God placed in my spirit regarding this year for this first conference here at Gateway and for everyone watching this program right now on Daystar and for all the campuses. And it's, and it's germane to this year indeed. Uh, we do live in difficult times. And, and these are difficult times, but and, and to a great degree, of many, even within the confines of the body, within the church family, have embraced this sort of perpetual motif of failure or, in the best-case scenario, survival. And, and so we have even believers that are, 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 have embraced this idea of failure and some have embraced the concept or the construct of perpetual survival. And, and that's not what God made you for. And God has greater things for you. And, and I want to share with you what God placed in my, in my heart. And, and, and it's going to be, listen, it's going to be expedited. It's going to be in a fast way. It's not going to be a latte, but a camel macchiato with a double espresso shot. So create some space. It's a little bit awkward, a little bit different, a little bit outside the box. I'm going to illustrate it. But, but it, it's what God placed in my heart. Y si no te gusta, alaba Dios por lo tanto, lo que sea, lo que Dios ponga en tu corazón. But, but, but here it is. In, in one biblical chapter, a man named Gideon. He went from both de facto and de jure failure, hiding in the threshing floor because he was afraid of the Midianite marauders, to surviving. He came out of the pit and accepted his calling to thriving. He built an altar and defeated the Midianites and changed his world. In one chapter. So God gave me a word for you today, confirmed again while I visited a certain coffee establishment ordering my grande non-fat upside down caramel macchiato. <laughs> that we are not, in spite of the naysayers who believe otherwise, the people that will fail. We are not those that will just survive. We're gonna change the world because we will do nothing less in the name of Jesus Christ than thrive. I want you to look at the neighbor you do, do, you do like and accept and tell them thrive. Tell the other neighbor, the one you tolerate, and tell him, thrive. <laughs> Find someone who you don't even like, but for the sake of your Christian motif, you have to embrace them. Tell him, thrive. <laughs> now, let me have my volunteers quickly. Where are my volunteers? Come quickly here. I want to title this one, Life Throws You Rocks, Build an Altar and Thrive. Here's the word of the Lord from Judges 6. Judges chapter 6, let's begin with verse 12. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. The 14th verse. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have, not the one that's forthcoming, but the one you have, and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. The 24th verse. And Gideon built an altar to the Lord there, named it Shalom, Yahweh Shalom, which means the Lord is peace, which means nothing missing, nothing broken. And the altar remains in the land to this day. Repeat after me, say thrive. thrive. Say it louder, say thrive. thrive. In Spanish, say prospera. Yeah. In Greek, say, oh, forget about it. Just that's good enough right there. If failure, because when the angel of the Lord confronts Gideon, 
in Judges 6, 11. He finds the people of Israel hiding in the threshing floor, accepting failure. They would work hard only to see the Midianites, the marauders, take their harvest. They were afraid, the Bible says they were afraid to confront. They were afraid to thrive. I've stated this before and I'll state it again. I am compelled. It behooves me to reiterate it. Today's complacency is tomorrow's captivity. And you are what you tolerate. And engaging this biblical narrative as a prophetic rubric, we need to understand the following truth. There are three types of people, even arguably to a great degree in the audience watching by television, definitely around the world. There are three types of people in the world watching and every single person in the world can fall into one of the corresponding categories. Three types of people. There are those that are failing, there are those that are surviving, and then there are those that are thriving. Every single person here, cada persona que está en este lugar en este momento, and I did not speak in tongues. <laughs> Every single person watching right now, you are either failing, you're living in failure, or you're barely making it, you're surviving, or you're thriving. Every single person can fall into one of these three respective categories. Via the conduit of a biblical metaphor, you're either in Egypt, the desert, or the promised land. Egypt, desert, or promised land. Repeat after me, say failure. failure. Say survive. survive. Say thrive. Now here's the word, here's the word, here's the word. Jesus was not born to a virgin, baptized in the Jordan, crucified on the cross, resurrected from the dead, and ascended to heaven so you and I would just fail or just survive. This is not why, because right now, the, the idea of, of just perpetual failure and survival, and then we have a church, even a church in America today, in 2016, that embraces this reality, and we're drinking the proverbial Kool-Aid out there, and whatever CNN and MSNBC and Fox News and ABC and NBC and CBS and even Univision preach to us, we drink the Kool-Aid, and we believe that we should be somehow here or here. He's not coming back for a failing church, and he's not coming back for a church that's barely making. Jesus is coming back for a glorious thrive. Church. So Jesus, 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 Jesus was not born to a virgin and baptized in the Jordan and crucified and resurrected and ascended. So you and I would just fail or survive. Jesus Christ, the Messiah the conqueror, the son of man, and the son of God. The way, the truth, and the life, the resurrection, and the life. La vida verdadera, el buen pastor, la puerta estrecha, la fuente inagotable, y el pan de vida. He came down, not for you and I to fail or just survive. He came to give us life and life abundantly. He came down so you and I would do nothing less than thrive. Somebody say thrive. thrive. Look at your neighbor, tell him thrive. thrive. Tell your other neighbor, tell him thrive. Because there is a difference. There is a difference. And you, you're going to understand that thrive is not sort of some sort of nomenclature or descriptor that is manipulated by the very variables of material possessions. It's way beyond that. But the idea, the reality, even be, this is kind of simplistic. We understand why God would not want us here. But even these two have to have somehow experience some sort of differential. What distinguishes between surviving and thriving? There's a difference between the desert and the promised land between living life and what my dear friend will call a blessed life, between I am okay and I'm more than a conqueror, between enough and more than enough, between full and overflow, between making it and conquering it, between existing and shining, between rhetoric and action, between speaking faith and bearing fruit, between having a dream and living out a vision, between surviving and thriving. There is a difference between existing and living, and God did not create you to occupy space. He made you to overflow with life in the name of Jesus. Jesus said the enemy's purpose, John 10, 10, 
is to rob, kill, and destroy, but my purpose is to give you life and life abundantly. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, your eye has yet to see, your ear has yet to hear, and your mind has yet to imagine the wonderful things that God has in store for those who love him. So why are you here? And why are you watching right now? You are here by divine appointment to hear from heaven via the word of God the very same thing that Gideon heard in this passage. Heaven shows up, and the angel of the Lord parenthetically tells Gideon, your failure season is over. And a matter of fact, as you read the rest of the passage of Judges chapter 6, the angel of the Lord not only tells him his days of hiding in the threshing floor, the days of captivity and failure are over, but he assures Gideon that he will never go back to failure again. So God placed you to hear this word because just like Gideon, some of you have been hiding in the proverbial threshing floor of life. You've been hiding from the Midianite marauders. The Midianites of this day and age have stolen your joy, your shalom, your children, your marriage, your peace, your health, your finances, your integrity, your morality, your righteousness, your purity, your holiness. You're here, you're here because you're tired of living a life where things are stolen, ripped off, and you have yet to see the fruit of the harvest. So I'm speaking to every single person who has experienced that threshing floor, to those who have yet to see the fullness of the promises fulfilled. The enemy has shown up to rob and kill and destroy the very things you hold near and dear. Well, I have news for you. And this is not a pathetic word stemming out of the womb of emotional exuberance. I am committed to biblical truth and orthodoxy. I am coming to you in the name of Jesus, led by the Spirit of God, to tell you this year, you will not live in failure. And this year, you're not just going to survive. Let me speak to you prophetically in the name of Jesus, you that are here in this audience, you that are watching right now by television. This year will not be your year of failure or just survival. You and your children and your children's children and your children's 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 children in the name of Christ will do nothing less than thrive. In the matter of fact, matter of fact, what, what time is it? What's the exact time, though? Like, I know, but what's the, like, what's the iPhone time? There's a reason for that. <laughs> Not the Android. It has to be iPhone, of course. <laughs> 7.52. I have, okay, 7.52. Okay, 7.52, 7.52. I'm going to wait to 7.53. Look at your neighbor. Tell them, neighbor. Uh, 7.52 for now. Because it, this is, why, why am I giving you the time? I'm, I kid you not, because I am believing in the name of Jesus that at this time, with fear and trembling in the name of the Lord, again, with an unbridled commitment to God's word, I am believing that at 7.53, I am we are about to declare that it, I don't care what lie, what the enemy constructed around you, in the time of Gideon, the enemy would construct an Asherah pole. An Asherah pole was literally a physical reminder of captivity. So the Midianites, the marauders, later on, Jezebel and Kate, the same, she had the same strategy, actually, the same modus operandi. They would construct an Asherah pole, which was this physical false god reminder they were under captivity. So every single morning, Gideon would wake up, and he would see this Asherah pole, and, and he was reminded, and he would live in failure because he embraced, he tolerated failure. So it's 750, 7, 753, because this is what we're declaring. Here's what I want you to do, son. When I say now, I want you to rip this poster up. Now, I don't want you to, to rip it up in some sort of, that's a cute illustrated sermon. I, wanted, I want you to rip it up in the name of Jesus, believing that every single person here and every single person watching by television, that their season of failure is over in the name of Jesus. For every single person who has experienced failure, failure in their families, their homes, their marriages, their integrity, their walk in Christ, their faith, whatever it may be, we are believing that that failure season is over. That they will, 2016 will not be a year of failure. It will be a year where they will thrive for the glory of Christ and they will see everything God has laid out for them. Are you ready to rip this? Okay. When I say now, I want you to rip that thing. Now, how, how you rip it, I'm not going to tell you all the specifics. But if I were you, there are some that have just, they're tired of seeing the Midianite Marauders show up. 
So I wouldn't just rip it one time. I would try to rip it, in a, and we'll vacuum later on. But, but I really want you to break this thing. Because even collectively in America, the church for the past, and I say this with great due deference, we've embraced a failure mentality. We have succumbed to the Asherah poles of culture and moral relativism, of governmental structures and paradigms that run counter to our Judeo-Christian value system. And instead of fighting it and coming out against it in the name of Jesus, we're hiding in the threshing floor. And we're satisfied with having our services and our celebrations on Sunday. All the while, this country is going to hell in a handbasket. We need a church to come out of failure. We need a church to come out of survival. We need a, we need a church this year to stand up in the name of Jesus and say we are not the generation that will fail and we are not the generation that will just survive. We are the generation that will thrive. We will thrive. We are the church of Jesus and we will thrive. Are you ready to rip this thing? All right, here. Here, just. Ah! Mm, not supposed to be that excited. The Midianites, say they came in, and the, the, the diabolical marauders, the fleshly thieves, with the assignment from hell to take away the harvest. And then they says, En este momento, los Midianitas. I, I'm provocado que la iglesia se esconda en el pozo. If that's what's happening, we're, we're a bunch of Gideons in the threshing floor. And all the, and all the, uh, are there any questions? <laughs> because this is, I, I kid you not, this is the hour, this is the year that we're going to come out of our threshing floor. <sighs> no, we really are. It begins you personally in your family, your home, your marriage, your ministry, your faith, and your integrity. And then corporately as a church, we're going to come out of the threshing floor. I mean, we, we, for the past, we've been hiding, but that season is over. We're coming out. So, 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 so here it is. And there's an anointing on this. So when I say now, I want you to rip this thing. Again, you're not just ripping and saying, oh, isn't that special? No. You're ripping it because failure is over. And I don't just mean personal failure. I mean corporate failure of the church sacrificing truth on the altar of political and cultural and sexual expediency. Let me... <laughs> Judges chapter 6. They, they, they actually had his... Gideon's father constructed, he drank the Kool-Aid. And, and because of political purposes, literally, because of political correctness, in order to somehow receive the validation of the collective Midianite marauders, what he did was he constructed a false altar to Baal. Read it. Do your biblical due diligence. He did. And, and they, they had this altar constructed. And then, so Gideon, when he comes out of this threshing floor pit, one, he brings down that altar. And he builds another one called Shalom. And, and actually, in chronological order, he built Shalom and then brought down the false altar. Because we, we, we and, oh boy. So he, he so that we're going to come, oh, what time is it? All right. All right. The Midianites were able to take the harvest because Gideon and the Israelites lived in failure. Oh, they got away. They got away. They got away with stealing the harvest because the, because the Israelites lived in failure. The Midianites of 2016, the Midianites in America and around the world are getting away because to a great degree, unfortunately, many sectors of the church live in, fa in fear. They live in fear. They live in fear. Fear of being called names. Fear of being called intolerant. Fear of being marginalized. We, we fear more the names that men may label upon us. Instead of walking on the authority of the name that is above all the other names. <laughs> Heaven showed up and took Gideon out of failure forever. He, Jesus Christ already broke the bondage of sin and failure forever. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. So if you have experienced some sort of failure in your life or if you have seen failure around you with your children or even in your culture, raise one hand. If you're tired of it, because if you're not tired of it, you're going to tolerate it. Raise both hands. If you're uberly, immensely tired of it and, and, you're, and you're saying, we're not going to take this anymore. We're coming out of our threshing floor. Raise both hands and a foot. <laughs> All right, so here it is. I was waiting. It says 759. Your season of failed dreams, failed integrity, failed righteousness, failed relationships, failed endeavors is over. 
And I'm not saying you will be perfect and you'll never make mistakes. What I can assure you with biblical certainty is that you will never live in failure again. I say a 40, that's the word of God. I say a 43, 13, from eternity to eternity, I am God. And no one will be able to snatch you away from my hand. And no one will be able to undo what I have done with you. Jude 1, 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, from failure, and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Now it's 8 o'clock. Now I'm ready. Come up here. At the count of three, I want you to break this. DJ, you're not breaking this just for a sermon illustration. For too long, we as the church have been hiding in the threshing floor. And we've permitted the enemy to get away and taking the harvest that belongs to us. We have permitted this to happen even in our watch, in our generation. We are Gideons and we're coming out of this failure threshing floor pit. And we're coming out and we're never stepping back in in the name of Jesus. And I'm speaking prophetically. This year, you will not live in failure and you will not just survive. You will thrive. So if you're ready to come out of failure, if you're ready to break failure forever, raise one hand. If you're ready to see failure broken in your family, home, marriage, and ministry, and community, raise both hands. If you're ready to see that spirit of failure, even in our nation, broken, raise both hands and a foot. Well, get ready. At the count of three, I want you to break this. And I am believing that something will break through here and will break through everyone watching right now. I, right now, este es el momento que el fracaso se termina en tu vida en el nombre de Jesús de Nazaret. This is the moment. When you go back home, failure will no longer be waiting for you. I am believing that you and... Are you ready? Let's do this. One... Two, three, break that thing. Look at your neighbor, tell him it is over. It's over. It's over. It's over. I dare you to tell your neighbor, my family will not fail. My faith will not fail. My future will not fail. My purpose will not fail. If you believe that, give God your best shout of praise. Oh. Our generation will no longer accept failure. We will not embrace the threshing floor constructs. We will not drink the Kool-Aid from the Midianite marauders. The failure is over. Thank you very much. <sighs> Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Judges 6, 14. Gideon comes out of failure and the first thing he does is he enters a survival mode. He wants to focus on his past and he asked the angel, Lord, why? Why did I have to go through that? We've all been through something. We've all been through something. If, I mean, we've all been through something. Really. But if you've never been through anything, I, I, I won't talk to you after the service. <laughs> because we've all been through something. And I, I'm going to ask one more time. I was a teacher for many years, so I'm compelled to ask him and raise your hand. I'm sorry. It's part of my DNA. If, if you've been through at least one major storm in life, I don't mean a migraine headache, I don't mean a pimple out of place, I mean you've been, you've been through one mucho grande storm in your life that should have taken you out, but somehow you survived. If you've been through at least one, raise one hand. If you've been through a couple of major storms that you survived, a couple of major ones, raise both hands. If you've been through so many you lost count, raise both hands and a foot. If you've been through so many that if I Google your, 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 your name up, the, your Instagram account shows up with a big storm picture on it. So why are you still here? Why are you alive today? Why did you survive? Because the purpose of God is greater than the brokenness of man. You survived. Matter of fact, you made it, you made it, you made it, and you made it not because you perfectly held on to God. You made it because God perfectly held on to you. You made it not because your faith was so efficient, but rather because his grace is always sufficient. You made it, you survived. You are a survivor. That's a, and all of us, this cannot be broken because all of us have to go through to get to. We, we have to survive. And, 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 even in the past year, past couple years, many have been through things, and, 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 and we are all survivors. And 
in the purpose of God, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, and because God always completes what he starts in your life, Philippians 1, 6, because he who called you is faithful, 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, because we, Isaiah 43, no matter what we go through, he will be with us. We all have to go through. All of us have been through something. So no matter what you've been through, and you may say, but I'm going through something now, we all have to go through. We do. I mean, it's a learning experience, the anointing and the acumen and the faith that grows in the midst of what we go through. We all have to go through. Joseph went through the pit to get to the palace. The Israelites went through the desert to get to the promised land. I mean, we all have to go through. Jesus fue a la cruz para tú y yo llegar aquí en este mismo momento. We all have to go through. But even if you're going through something right now, I can with biblical certainty tell you that you will make it to there. And you will say, that's a little bit exuberant, presumptuous. How dare you say that? Where's the biblical proof? Oh, real, simple. Here's the question. As a matter of fact, ask your neighbor. Neighbor, did Joseph stay in the pit? Did the Israelites stay in the desert? Uh, did Jonah stay in the whale? Did Daniel stay in the den? Did Jesus stay in the tomb? Well, I'm not staying either. I'm coming out and I'm going to see everything that God has for me and my family. It's simple. We are all. Because when heaven starts it, hell cannot stop it. I'll say that one more time for the hearing impaired. When heaven starts it, hell cannot stop it. And, and, and I'm, and I'm going to share something with you. I, I am a Trekkie. I am an evangelical Trekkie. I was a math nerd. I was a computer engineering major at Penn State University. I would make fun of things that would take place, even in certain churches, a lot of fun. And, 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 and I doubted many things. I saw Elmer Gentry everywhere. I thought that a lot of what we saw in churches was snake oil salesmen, and it was fake, and it was pathetic. So I had my true encounter with God, where I, I, I experienced the living God in my life. And I used to critique even people in the churches that would engage in what would just happen before. I mean, there's thousands of people here, and before the worship leader was here, and then I saw Pastor Robert Morris, he was facing the carpet. And, you know, to me, at one time, I would have said, how can someone with so much intellect and, and cognitive acumen, how can you be so cognitively inclined and just acquiesce in a motif where you're in front of thousands of people and here you are? You know, I mean, this is just ludicrousy to a degree. I used to critique that and call it emotionalism and exuberance and just outside the confines of reality until I survived my journey. And then I discovered, I, used to, I, I even used to think that praise was contextualized in the context of pigmentation, which means I used to think that, we respectfully, I used to think that, uh, I was a Trekkie, so I used to think that, that white Christians were more like Spock. <laughs> and they were very logical. And then, and that black and Latino Christians were more like William Shatner, <laughs> Captain Kirk, the old school Captain Kirk. And, 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 be, and they were a little bit more, woo. So I used to think it was all culturally contextualized. And, and then I found out it has nothing to do with culture. I found out why there's a reason why people will bow down and worship in front of thousands of people or even privately in their home. I found out there's a reason why people shout and raise their hands and say hallelujah and glory to God. I discovered the reason why. I found out that worship has an equation. I found out that the size of your praise is directly proportional to the magnitude of the hell that God takes you out of. I'll say that one more time. The size of your praise is directly proportional to the magnitude of the hell that God took you out of. So if God took you out of a little hell, then you give him a little praise. But if he saved you, if he delivered you, if he healed you, if he turned you around, if he placed your feet on solid ground, then you open up your mouth and you give God your highest. Because we survive, we survive, we survive, we survive, we survive, and I'm, I'm gonna hurry, I'm gonna hurry, I'm gonna hurry. We survive, and oh, 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 one more thing. We survive, we all go through things. And Gideon came out from failure, and he entered his survival mode. And he had questions, and God shows up, and the angel of the Lord, and then subsequently he says, the Lord. And he says, you are a mighty warrior. Go with the strength you have, defeat the Midianites. That's pretty crazy stuff. I mean, it's like, Cuckoo for Cocoa Puff stuff too. Because the guy was hiding in the threshing floor. The guy was just hiding. And the angel of the Lord shows up and says, you're a mighty warrior. And then the, the, in, in Hebrew, the verbiage there is very important. So exegetically speaking, when you read the narrative, it's not, you will one day be a mighty warrior. 
after 40 steps in three books and two lessons, you will be a mighty warrior. Heaven shows up not to condemn him or judge him. Heaven shows up to define him. That's what heaven does. You are a mighty warrior. You are a mighty warrior. You are a mighty warrior. No matter what you're going through or what you've been through, understanding that you're defined, I stated this when I was here for the blessing, not by the hell you may be going through, but by the heaven you're going to. You are defined by God's purpose in your life. In a matter of fact, you're defined by everything God says about you because you are. And, and one more thing, it, it doesn't even matter right now if you see God in the midst of what you're going through. You just messed it up, Pastor Sam. That's theologically woo-woo. You can't say that. No, 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 here's what I mean. In, there's no, in Daniel chapter three, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fiery furnace, do your biblical due diligence first. I want you to tell me where it says that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego saw the fourth man in the fiery furnace, that they acknowledge him. No, it says that Nebuchadnezzar, the one that threw them in there, he saw the fourth man in the fiery furnace. So right now, you may not see God the way you think you should be seeing God in the midst of what you're going through it doesn't matter what matters is that hell sees God in the midst of what you're going through what matters is that Nebuchadnezzar sees God in the midst of what you're going through because whether you see him or not he is right there so go back survive we're not going to break you because sometimes we need you come here thrive thrive it means this right here You must learn to climb out of hell to survive, but you must learn to bring down heaven to thrive. Oh, one of them is the battle of your heart. The other one is the battle of your mind and for your mind. There's a difference between surviving and thriving. Come here, survive for a second. Let me bring you back. You know how people surviving, how they pray, the majority of their prayers? And there's nothing wrong with it, but you have to jump out of that to this and not to get stuck here. The majority of people that are surviving pray like this, Lord bless me, Lord bless me, Lord bless me, Lord bless me. The people that thrive say, Lord, make me the greatest blessing to everyone I know in the name of Jesus. This is where they pray. Lord, answer my prayer, and that's okay. Answer my prayer, answer my prayer. And as Daddy James reminds us, this is where people emerge and say, make me the answer to someone else's prayer. Somebody say thrive, thrive. This is about mirrors and this is about windows. You are a mighty hero. It always begins with identity. Thrive with who you are. Thrive with, you are a mighty hero. Do not permit others to define you. Do not permit your surroundings, your critics, your haters, your flesh, or your past to define you. He worked in a threshing floor, and God says you are a mighty warrior. You will not and cannot come out of failure until you know who you are in Christ and who Christ is in you. We fail because we embrace a false definition. We suffer from identity moratorium. To thrive, you must know who you are. He begins by telling him, you are a mighty warrior. You can't embrace what God has for you until you embrace what God did for you. It may look like a failure, but in reality, you are a mighty warrior. Let me tell you what you're not. You're not a mistake. You're not a random occupier of space and time. You're not the devil's punching bag. You're not the enemy's trophy. You're not a failure. You're not just a survivor. You're a child of God, created in his image, washed by his flood, filled with his spirit, called, chosen, and covered, forgiven, free, and favored. You are a child of God indeed. You are wonderfully and fearfully made, Psalm 139, 14. You are the apple of his eye. You are his treasured possession, Deuteronomy 7, 6. And you are called chosen and faithful, Revelation 17, 14. Christ defines you. Raise your right hand and say, Jesus Christ defines me. Repeat after me, say, the cross defines me. The empty tomb defines me. The blood of Jesus defines me. I am defined by the Father. I am defined by the Son. And I am defined by the Holy Spirit. Thrive with who you are. Thrive with what you have, he says. Go with what you have. Go with what you have. Stop focusing on the things that are missing and give God praise for what you already have. Focus on what, go not with what's forthcoming, go with what you have. 
You have a faith that moves mountains, a shout that brings down walls. You have a joy that cannot be explained, a peace that passes all understanding. You have a grace that is sufficient, an anointing that destroys the yoke, a destiny that cannot be stopped, mercies that are new every morning. You have the strength of the Father, the grace of the Son, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You have Jesus. You have everything. Thrive in what you have. Thrive in the face of your weakness, Judges 6.15. My clan is the weakest. I am the least of them. God does not call the perfect. He calls the willing. He does not call the one that has it all. He calls upon those that will surrender it all. Oh. I finish. Thrive with Shalom. When he came out, a failure in survival, he began to thrive. This is what he did. He built Shalom, we read it. The altar that says peace where nothing is missing and nothing is broken. And then, here comes. There was this Asherah pole. This is so prophetic for us and for this nation. There was this pole constructed to remind them of their captivity. I love this. And the Lord gives this Gideon, who's no longer failing or surviving but thriving, clear instructions. You see that Asherah pole right there, that reminder? cut it down. You would assume for a second he would cut it down and discard it and throw it away. And the Lord said, cut it down. Right there, cut it down, but don't throw it away. Use it to fuel your altar. I'm going to say that one more time. Whatever the enemy constructed to hold you back this year, God's going to turn it around, you're going to cut it down, and it will be the fuel, it will be literally the resource that will fuel the altar of shalom in your life. What does that mean, Pastor Rodriguez? Whatever the enemy created to stop you, it will not stop you. It will actually be the resource that will fuel your destiny and the greatest year thus far of your life. Cut it down. That's Judges 6, 25. Whatever hell constructed to keep you in your past will be cut down and fuel your future. Therefore, from this moment on, you will not be defined by the wall in front of you. You will be defined by the shout inside of you. You will not be defined by the giant that rises up against you. You will be defined by the stone that brings him down. I conclude. I, uh, uh, Pastor Robert just reminded me of this a few moments ago. I shared this with James when I was here for, for James's conference. Some years back, I was invited in, to, to, to speak, actually to pray at an event in Washington, D.C. If anyone wants to see the video testimonies of those that were there, for the skeptics, uh, they can speak to Tony Suarez, Bishop Angel Nunez, Carlos Duran, and others that were there, countless that were there. And those videos are available on our website. I was invited to Washington, D.C. It was a secular event. There were over a, a great number of people, hundreds of, a couple hundred thousand people gathered in a secular event. And, and when I was first invited, I even asked the, the, the television personality who you would recognize who's a friend who invited me I asked him why are you inviting me I, I'm a Californian so I said hey dude why are you inviting me and it's, it's a secular event why would you need me there why what do you want me to do he goes I want you to pray and I go but it's a secular event what, what? And, and he and he actually said why not good point so I went, I went to Washington and I, and, and as I, I, you know, and I went to Washington and I had my, I arrived and there was this kid that was crying all the way from, from San Francisco to Washington. And when we got off the plane, I couldn't sleep at all because of the kid that was crying. It was more of a toddler and, and, and I wanted to lay hands on the kid, but not in the name of Jesus. And so I went and I got my camera macchiato and I went to, to, to the place and I went backstage and I ran up and he looks at me and he says, he goes, Pastor Sam, I have some news for you um, because the people heard that you were the one praying, the committee, the, there's always a committee, the committee decided that they should invite other faith groups to pray likewise. And I went, oh, wow, I, I prepared something assuming I would be the only one. He went, that, that was the original plan, but, you know, can you accommodate? And I went, okay. He goes, do you want to go first or last? Something inside of me said, son, go last so you can fix the mess everybody else makes before you. <laughs> Politically incorrect, I know, how terrible of me. So, so they went up, and, the first, and they all went up, nice people, affable people. They went up, and the first person prayed, and, 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 and the person she prayed, and, 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 you know, God, you're the God of many names and no name at all, and, and you're the air, the wind, the tree, the leaf. You are everything, and yet you are nothing. Amen. Amen. 
And then a rabbi prayed, beautiful prayer, and then a, a, an imam prayed, and, 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 and in his context, and I came up, and I went, I went up, I'm arguing with God, I'm saying, God, how do I pray, how do I pray, how do I pray? I don't want to offend anyone, there's cameras here, television cameras here, all the networks are here, I don't want to be controversial, I don't want to be polarizing, I don't want to marginalize, I had a prayer prepared, but I don't want to offend them, how do I pray? How do I pray? I mean, I mean do I pray in the name of Kumbaya, love, you know, Barney, the big wind? How do I pray? So how do I pray? So I'm coming up, and I'm fighting with God, I, I kid you not, I'm doing it in Spanish, so people wouldn't hear me, so I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming up, and, and I hear the Spirit of God tell me, son, pray the way you pray at church. You guys have never been to my church. So I, I got the microphone, I went upstage, hit the microphone, went like this, started, picked up the microphone, and I went, let's pray. I kid you not, there's a guy named Tony Suarez who works for me now, who came to work for me because of that prayer, what he saw that day. And he, they, they were all quiet, deer in headlights, going like, why are we praying in the first place? It's not, a, it's, not, it's not a religious event, it's a secular event. Get this guy off the stage. So I get the mic, hola. Mm -hmm. The other faith leaders were there, so. Mm -hmm. Looked up, cameras, and I said, let us pray. Mm -hmm. In the name that is above all the other names, in the name to whom which every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. No other name given unto man through by which salvation has come unto all mankind. In the name of he who saves, in the name of he who delivers, in the name of he who heals, in the name of he who's coming back again. In the holy, mighty, righteous, victorious, triumphant name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Stay standing, I'm gonna just, I'm finishing. Oh, real quick, but that's what they did. Matter of fact, you're already standing. That's what they did. But I kid you not, for three and a half, four minutes, maybe four and a half, they wouldn't sit or stand, they wouldn't even be quiet. For four, a, a politician came up and he tried to speak and he couldn't because the crowd wouldn't shut up. They just kept on. And I'm walking off the stage, and my friends are with me. I'm walking off. People are going, what? all the secular people are going, why? Why are people responding like this? It's real simple. There is still power in the name of Jesus. I said there's power in the name of Jesus. Hey, Gateway. Hey, America. Hey, the world. There is still power in the name of Jesus. Get out of failure. Do not just survive. You need to thrive. You need to thrive. 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 Lift up your voice and thrive. Raise your right hand. Let me declare this upon you and walk away. From this moment, you will not in 2016. From this moment, my God, this season, you will not go back to the pit. You will not drown in the threshing floor. You will not sacrifice truth on Baal's altar. You will not listen to the Midianites. You will not bow before the Asherah pole. You will not believe the lies, sacrifice truth, quench the spirit, hide the light or conform to this world. You will not fail or merely survive. You and your house will do nothing less in Jesus Christ than to thrive. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.